As I approach the age of 50, just twice the age at which my first book, The Outsider, appeared, I realize more clearly than ever that my life has been dominated by a single obsession, a search for what I call the other mode of consciousness. An example will clarify my meaning. A musician friend once told me how he had returned home after a hard day's work, feeling rather tired and depressed. He poured himself a whiskey and put a record on the gramophone. It was a suite of dances by Praetorius. As he drank the whiskey, he began to relax. Suddenly, he says, he took off. The music and the whiskey entered into some kind of combination that produced a feeling of wild happiness, a rising tide of sheer exhilaration. Why describe this as another mode of consciousness? rather than simply as ordinary consciousness transformed by happiness. Because it can lead to experiences that seem completely beyond the range of normal consciousness. A BBC producer friend told me how he had sat in an empty control room at the BBC and played himself a record of the Schubert Octet, which happened to be on the turntable. Suddenly, he said, he became Schubert. I was intrigued and tried to get him to be more precise. Did he have a kind of time slip into Schubert's Vienna, so he knew what Schubert had eaten for lunch on the day he started composing? No, this was not what he meant. He tried to explain that he felt as if he was composing music, so that he could understand why Schubert had written each bar as he had, and precisely what he might put into the next bar. I saw that what he was describing was not mystical or occult experience, but simply an unusually deep sense of empathy. Sartre once said that to enjoy a book is to rewrite it. My friend had done the same for Schubert's Octet, We are bound to enter into music, if it is to be more than just meaningless noise. But clearly my friend had entered into it ten times as deeply as usual, like going down in a lift. But then perhaps it is a mistake to emphasize this element of empathy or sympathy. I had a similar experience when writing a book about Bernard Shaw. A friend had borrowed a book that I wanted to consult and on this particular morning he returned it. So I sat down at my typewriter, feeling pleased I had it back. It was a pleasant, warm day, with the sun streaming through onto my desk. I was writing the chapter about Shaw's marriage and breakthrough, after years of plodding around London's theatres and concert halls as a critic. No doubt I was identifying with Shaw, imagining what it must have been like to feel that you had sailed out of a storm into a quiet harbor. But this was not what explained that sudden feeling of intense joy, as if my heart had turned into a balloon and was sailing up into the air. It was not just Shaw's life that was somehow passing through my mind. It was something bigger, a sense of the multiplicity of life itself, In a sense, I was back in Edwardian London, but it could just as easily have been Goethe's Weimar or Mozart's Salzburg. In fact, this other mode of consciousness is a state of perception rather than empathy, an awareness of a wider range of fact, of the actuality of the world outside me. What had changed in such experiences is our perspective. I am used to seeing the world in what might be called visual perspective. That is, with the objects closest to me looking realer and larger than the objects in the middle distance, which in turn look realer and larger than the objects on the horizon. In these experiences, we seem to sail above this visual perspective, and the objects on the horizon are as real as my fingers and toes. This is the experience that lay at the heart of the outsider. The romantic outsiders, 
Rousseau, Shelley, Hoffman, Hulerlin, Berlioz, Wagner, Dostoevsky, Van Gogh, Nietzsche, were always experiencing flashes of the other mode of consciousness, with its tantalizing hint of a new kind of perception, in which distant realities are as real as the present moment. But this created a new problem, intense dissatisfaction with the ordinary form of consciousness, with its emphasis on the immediate and the trivial. So the rate of death by suicide or tuberculosis was alarmingly high among writers and artists of the 19th century. Many of them seemed to feel that this was inevitable, that death and despair were the price you paid for these flashes of the other mode. Even a relatively latecomer to the scene like Thomas Mann continued to think of the problem in terms of these bleak opposites, stupidity and health or intensity and death. I was inclined to question this equation. In many cases, the misery seemed self-inflicted. Eliot was right when he snapped. Shelley was a fool. Shelley was a fool to fall in love with every pretty face that came by. A fool to believe that England could be improved by violent revolution. A fool to give way to self-pity every time he got depressed and to feel that the situation could be improved by lying down like a weary child to weep away this life of care. The same criticism applies to a large number of romantic outsiders. Still, even when full allowance was made for weakness and self-pity, there was another problem that could not be dismissed so easily. L. H. Myers had called it The Near and the Far, in a novel of that title. The young prince, Jali, gazes out over the desert in the light of the setting sun and reflects that there are two deserts, one that was a glory for the eye, another that was a weariness to trudge, the near and the far. And the horizon with all its promise is always the far. The near is trivial and boring, Heisman's had made the same point amusingly in Arabur, where after reading Dickens, the hero de Saint has a sudden craving for London. While waiting for his train, he goes to the English tavern near the Gare saint Lazare, and eats roast beef and potatoes and drinks a pint of ale. Then it strikes him that he has, so to speak, tasted the essence of England and that it would be madness to risk spoiling such unforgettable experiences with a clumsy change of locality. So he takes a cab back home. Yet Myers had also glimpsed an answer when he made Jolly reflect. Yes, one day he would be vigorous enough in breath and stride to capture the promise of the horizon. He may not have believed it himself, but it still was the correct answer, vitality. In 1960, my conviction was confirmed by the work of an American professor of psychology, Abraham Maslow. Maslow said that he got tired of studying sick people because they never talked about anything but their illnesses. So he decided to study healthy people instead. He soon made an interesting discovery that healthy people frequently had peak experiences, flashes of immense happiness. For example, a young mother was watching her husband and children eating breakfast when a beam of sunlight came through the window. It suddenly struck her how lucky she was, and she went into the peak experience, the other mode. Maslow made another interesting discovery. When he talked to his students about peak experiences, they began recollecting peak experiences which they had had. As they began thinking about and discussing peak experiences, they began having them regularly. In other words, the peak experience, the moment when the near and the far seemed to come together, 
is a product of vitality and optimism, but it can also be amplified or repeated through reflection by turning the full attention upon it instead of allowing it to merely happen. The case of the young mother reinforces the point. She was happy as she watched her husband and children eating, but it was an unreflective happiness. The beam of sunlight made her feel, I am happy, and instantly intensified it. It is as though we possessed a kind of mirror inside us, a mirror which has the power to turn things that happen into experience. It seems that thought itself has a power for which it has never been given credit. This was a major discovery. It meant that, contrary to the belief of the Romantics, the other mode is within our control. Shelley asked the spirit of beauty, Why dost thou pass away and leave our state, this dim veil of tears, vacant and desolate? The answer in Shelley's case was clearly that he went around with the assumption that human existence is a vast, dim veil of tears, and regarded the peak experiences as visitations of the awful shadow of some unseen power, instead of recognizing that the unseen power lay within himself. What we are speaking about is what Gottfried Benn called primal perception. That sudden sense of matchless clarity that gives the world a new minted look. We find it in the sharp outlines of Japanese art, with its white mountain peaks and electric blue skies. T. E. Lawrence describes one in The Seven Pillars of Wisdom. We started out on one of those clear dawns that wake up the senses with the sun, while the intellect tired after the thinking of the night was yet a bed. For an hour or two on such mornings, the sounds, scents, and colors of the world struck man individually and directly, not filtered through or made typical by thought. They seemed to exist sufficiently by themselves. Lawrence had also put his finger on the reason that we experience primal perception so infrequently. The filter of thought, of the mind's expectations. It could also be described as the robot, the mechanical part of us. Our robot is invaluable. It takes over difficult tasks like driving the car or talking a foreign language and does them far more easily and efficiently than when we are doing them consciously. But it also gets used to spring mornings and Mozart's symphonies, destroying the glory and the freshness that makes the child's world so interesting. The robot may be essential to human life, but he makes it hardly worth living. The robot seems to be located in the brain. This is clear from the effects of psychedelic drugs like LSD and mescaline, which apparently achieve their effect by paralyzing certain chemical messengers in the brain. The result is certainly a form of primal perception, as Aldous Huxley noted when he took mescaline. He quoted Blake's statement, If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. So cleansing the doors of perception is basically a matter of brain physiology. In the mid-sixties, I began reading books on the brain. One result was a novel called The Philosopher's Stone, in which I suggest that the secret of primal perception may lie in the prefrontal cortex. But it was more than ten years later that I came upon a crucial piece of research that threw a new light on the whole question. The result was revelatory.